we've been talking about continuing. See, continue is important because you didn't. Sometimes we don't know how important something is until somebody begins to share with you how important it is. And your continuing is very, very critical to your whole life as a Christian. And we showed you in 1 Corinthians 13, and it only has 13 verses, that that's the blueprint to develop discipleship. When you're talking about being transformed into a disciple, because that's the goal. The goal is to be transformed into a disciple. Somebody that mimics, looks like, act like, talk like, just like their mentor. Uh, I've seen that happen in several occasions. You know, I, I can listen to certain ministers, and then I know they're, they're spiritual children because they sound like them. They got some of the same phraseology. They got some of the same movements. Not because they're trying to be that person, but because they were mentored. They became a true disciple. When you are a true disciple, you're going to take on some of the same characteristics as the person that's training you. You take on their mentality. Because that's what discipleship does. And that can be good and that can be bad. Because, look, the world is discipling people every day. We need to be as busy or busier than the world. Amen? All right. So this morning, if you will... Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. When you have it, say, I have it. Now, Peter is giving us a very sound instruction here. He says, wherefore, are you there? 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 13, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, the word mind here is actually talking about your imagination. When I ran the reference on it, it's talking about the imagination here, not just your, your will and your, but it says, take your imagination and bring it under control. He says, gird up your imagination. Why? You have to have an imagination to continue. He says, be sober and hope to the what? End for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the form of lust in your ignorance. He says, not making yourself to keep. He, say, he, says, he says, don't keep making yourself reach back from where you left. You know, it's, it's almost like a person addicted to bad company. You know, you got some women, they ain't happy unless they're with a bad boy. They don't like a man that's clean and got good sense. They want a thug. And unless he come thug and don't care nothing about them and ripping their hair out and slapping them on the face and calling them a dog and everything else, they're not happy. Something wrong with both of them. But you'd be surprised how many women don't know how to function in a good relationship. Oh, he says, as obedient children, stop shaping again your lives after the desires that you said I want to be free from. Now, if I've been delivered from lying and stealing, and why do I want to hang out with those people that's doing that? He, say, he says, don't keep going backwards. He says, because that's going to keep you from moving forward. This, this is going to become important in just a little bit. You're going to see the, the, the correlation. He says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the form of lust, he, you see, it was just lust inside of you in your ignorance. You were ignorant, and you did a lot of stuff that didn't make sense. He says, but as a obedient children now, you need to stop that. You did that when you say you didn't know no better. You were acting like that. <laughs> said change. 
He said, instead, begin to shape your lives to look like, become like the Holy One who called you. Oh, so there's a progression naturally and spiritually that is expected of me. Because why? I'm turning into somebody else. I'm turning into somebody else. And that person is Jesus. Mm. He says in verse 16, because it is written, somebody say because it's written. And because it is written, you don't have an option. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Be like me. Mm. Because I am holy, I'm expecting you to be holy. Well, that puts a new twist on a whole lot of stuff we see today. Okay. Now look at look at verse 1 Peter chapter 4. Mm. Can we I'm trying to switch your mindset from thinking like you used to think. Say I'm say I'm thinking better. All right, because you're learning more, right? So you're thinking better. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, don't think it's foreign to you. Don't think it's strange concerning the fire trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. He said these are things you're supposed to know. See, in continuing, you got to know opposition. Remember I told you that opposition is necessary to continue. You're going to have opposition. You can't avoid it. Opposition comes to all of us. You cannot avoid it. And God won't allow you to avoid opposition. You don't know who you are until something is opposing you. How many of y'all, because I've seen some mamas rise up when they thought somebody was coming against their baby. They look, the adrenaline and everybody else's strength. Look like it flowed into you at that moment. Don't hurt my baby. Yeah. See, that's the way we're supposed to participate. <laughs> we're not supposed to think it's strange that something is coming against us. We're living in this dual system. There's a kingdom of darkness. Then there's a kingdom of Jesus, his dear son, the kingdom of light. And they're both vying for your space. And how you, say how, how you do something denotes which kingdom you're participating from. Mm. Now, I want to read Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14, out of another translation. And it's simply saying, well, I read it from the King James so you understand. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. See, <laughs> if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. <laughs> Every time I read this, I think about, because uh, Regina and I was talking about when we were walking in the park and we were called the what? How many of my walkers still here? What were we called? The sanctified striders. Did we win, ladies? Yeah. Absolutely. You know why? Because one of the things I taught them, when you walk, don't look back. It'll slow you down. I learned that from Apostle Paul. He says, this is one thing I don't do. I don't keep looking back. I forget those things which are behind me, and I got to reach forth. Why? Because looking back, you got, you got to miss a step, keep trying to look back. <laughs> and they lost territory trying to hang out in the past. Hmm. Because, see, the past is too familiar, and moving forward is so different. And you don't, and, and if you don't get rooted and grounded in the things of God, you won't press. Apostle Paul says, I press. Mm. 
That means I got to go against the grain. I'm pressing now. I'm doing something that's uncomfortable. But I got a goal in mind. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, one translation reader says it like this. I'm not there yet, nor have I become perfect or totally completed. But I am charging on to gain anything and everything the anointed one, Jesus, has in store for me. So that means the violent, only the violent going to get this. Only the violent one's going to have this. Ah. The kingdom of God suffered violence. It's not the devil being against the kingdom of God, no. It means you're taking territory. And the violent does what? Take it. Mm. But you got to take it where? Here. Because you don't need that force in heaven. You need, to, uh, you need to show that force here. He says, he says, and nothing will stand in my way because he has grabbed me and won't let me go. Brothers and sisters, as I said, I know I have not arrived, but there's one thing I am doing. I'm leaving my old life behind, putting everything on the line for this mission. Mm. I am sprinting toward the only goal that counts, to cross the line, to win the prize, and to hear God's call to resurrection life found exclusively in Jesus, the anointed one. Ooh, he said, that's the only goal I have, is to cross the finish line. Now, there are some things that you have to know if you're going to continue. So in order to advance or to continue, we must draw the line somewhere. We must distinguish ourselves from the world. Because the world is a drawing cue to, to go backwards. Every time you look back, you're losing ground. You're not moving forward. You're not standing still, but you're going backwards. So we must draw the line somewhere. We must distinguish ourselves from the world. So to do this, we must know some things. Number one, for those that like to take notes. When praying, every prayer you pray must be a prayer of faith or it is not heard. You got to understand that. God not hearing your fear, doubt, and unbelief. He says, when you come to me, you must come to me knowing that I am and that I am a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek me. Now look at Luke chapter 12, verse 32. So when praying, every prayer must be a prayer of faith or it is not heard. And see, God wants to hear you. He says, because it gives him pleasure. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You got to know that, that when I pray, God's whole heart is to give me the kingdom. And I must pray that in faith, knowing that that's his desire to give me the kingdom. I can't have no if, ands, and buts if whether or not God would do something for me. Mm. He says it gives God pleasure when we come to him in faith. Why? Because he's always looking to give unto us. That's his desire. But you got to know that. Otherwise, you won't come in faith. You'll come assuming that he might do it. He says, no, it's my pleasure to give you the kingdom. You're so special. I want to give you the kingdom. And there's so much kingdom that I can give it all to you and give it all to the next person next to you and not miss a beat. Mm. Second, you don't blend with the world. These are things you got to know if you're going to continue. You cannot blend with the world. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. See, these are things 
that I call hiccups. When you don't have a clear understanding about certain things, you're going to keep falling. Why? Because the, the past is calling you. It's trying to get you back in its grasp. And you got to get far enough away from it that you don't look nothing like it anymore. So my second point is don't blend with the world. Are you at 2 Corinthians chapter 6? Let's look at verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Oh, for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? Why is your best friend still a sinner? Don't you know you're going to contaminate your faith? Especially if you're not on a mission to win them. Oh, girl, come on. Ain't nothing wrong. Everybody take a little sip. <laughs> verse 15. No. What fellowship? Go back to verse uh, 14. And for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? You can't fellowship with unrighteousness. Don't mean you dislike people, but you can't fellowship. That can't be your go-to spot. When you feel lonely or you need somebody to talk to, you got to learn how to have a good fellowship with the Holy Spirit. If you ain't got nobody, excuse my English, if you don't have anyone that you can pick the phone up and talk to, that's righteous. See, that gets us in a lot of trouble because we talk to people that are not spiritual and we show them our weaknesses. Some people are born again, but they still don't believe like you. You got to be careful how you sit down and have fellowship. Fellowship is covenant. I'm cutting covenant with somebody when I'm having fellowship. This is not a passing conversation. No, I'm having fellowship. Eating with people is having fellowship. If you understood what they did in the Bible, this is why they never sat down and just ate with anybody. It had purpose. Food had purpose. It meant that we're in agreement. When you sit at my table, I sat at your table. It means we are in covenant. We think a lot. We believe a lot. Mm. Says, what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? Light and dark don't talk the same language. Hmm. And what concord, what agreement have Christ with the devil or Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an unbeliever or infidel? How, how, how do we communicate? On a daily basis, how do we communicate? What do we discuss with an unbeliever? Am I opening up portals to my life to an unbeliever that I shall only be opening up to the Spirit of God? How do I expect to win that believer, the unbeliever rather, after I've given them my history and all my drama? You're not going to win them. Because you demoted yourself. You brought, your, just like Pastor DJ said on Wednesday, you brought yourself down to their level. When you are cut above. Your stuff not so hard pressed that if you go pray in the Holy Ghost for a half hour, that feeling of needing to talk to somebody, it'll go away. Oh, I know I'm hitting. But see, this is how you continue. You got to you gotta make a distinguishing mark between you and the world. You can't, you can't keep blending, trying to get along. I know what you said. Man, watch this. Look at verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? What agreement? We're talking about the temple now, your temple, you the temple. How do I take this temple of God 
and carry it to some place that God is not in. All for the sake of having fun. Now you know why you have problems continuing. Ooh, Jesus. He says, for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I'm living in you. And I want to walk in you. And I want to be your God. And you're supposed to be my people. Verse 17, wherefore, wherefore, come out from among them and be you what? Sanctified. Sanctified, set aside for his use only. See, that's what your body is supposed to be, set aside, not slipping and dipping, not committing fornication or adultery, in and out, not doing the same things your body had you doing prior to you getting saved. See, there's got to be this distinguishing line that is drawn between you and the world then he says in verse 18 then i will be a father can't be no father to nobody that won't listen to you running in and out they're not looking for a father at that moment they're looking for fun looking for love in all the wrong places <laughs> remember that song he says, and I will be a father unto you. Because that's, that's his ultimate goal, is to be a father unto you. And he says, you'll be my sons and my daughters. And he says, he says and I will show my goodness to you. Mm. See, blending, look, look what the Lord showed me. He says, blending has created for many believers a problem of recognizing who's really born again and who's not. See, there's a problem. And now you don't want to offend that person because they all they got to throw at you is, I'm, I'm a Christian. How many times have you heard that? You got a lot of uh, artists saying that now. I'm a Christian. Let the life prove it. Before you jump on the bandwagon and start being their gospel promoter. Let them prove it out. He says, he said, because it's, it's difficult in this hour, because why? The world's way of doing church has slipped into the church and has diminished the anointing because light and dark can't fellowship. It's like oil and vinegar. They don't blend. You can shake it up. You can put it in a mixer. But when it settles, they separate. They go back to being what they are. You can't mix them. Oh, yes, I know. He said the world's way of doing church has cost the church the anointing. We have people dressing like the world, singing songs that are not anointed, listening to lessons that have no life in them. Just a lot of stuff being tossed out. They say it's church, and I'm a Christian. But no yokes are being destroyed and no burdens are being removed. He says, if you're going to continue. Now, as I said previously, we must draw the line and begin to distinguish or set ourselves apart from the world. Because, see, this is part of your job. You must sanctify yourself. Thirdly, you must know that the Father God knew you were coming. And he provided for you, so he provided for me. In advance. You and I are not a surprise to God. Look at Psalms 54, verse 4. <laughs> I'm reading this from another translation. God is my helper. The Lord is the provider for my life. When I saw that, I'm telling you, I got so excited. See, knowing this one thing should encourage you to stay the course and keep moving forward. Knowing that God, see, when you know that God has already provided, you are not easily sidetracked because of something out of the ordinary. 
Why? I have a knowing on the inside that God has already provided for me. Not only for this case that I'm dealing with right now, but for my whole life. Ooh. There's not a part of me that he has not already provided for me in advance. These are things you got to know when you plan on continuing. So say to yourself, the Father God has already, in advance, provided for me. And he has provided for my whole life. So there's nothing about you that he hasn't provided for. So you got to know that if you plan on continuing. Because why? The devil going to throw a monkey wrench into the game and make it seem like God doesn't care about what you're dealing with. You got a financial need going on. And but see, what you need to do is to get closer so he can give you the answer. Not run to the past. Okay, fourth point. I'm, 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 I'm helping this morning. Those online, keep writing. And if not, go back and watch the service again. Amen? Number four, God will not arbitrarily do what you are to do. I'll repeat it. God will not arbitrarily do what you are to do. So many times I see people not advancing because they are waiting on God to just arbitrarily do something that they are supposed to do. Mm. The word arbitrarily means to think that an action, rule, or decision is not based on any principle, plan, or system. Using power without limits and without considering other people. See, God doesn't work that way. He needs your involvement. So if he were going to do what you expect him to do arbitrarily, you wouldn't have to believe. You don't need any faith. But you'd be amazed how many people say they say, believe that way. The Lord going to do it. What's your part in it? So sometimes you are asking God to do things that you say, I have to turn the switch on to make it happen. Ooh. Example. If I go into my bedroom or you go into your bedroom or your living room and the room is dark, what is expected? If I want light, what do I have to do? Turn the switch on. I can't call God and say, God, would you go to the wall and turn the switch on? Now, see, as fun as that might sound, people believe that way. God said, what, what? I'm not going to get ahead of my notes. <laughs> so do you expect God to turn the switch on? Or are you supposed to turn it on? So if you stay in the dark, whose fault is it? See? See, having a false expectation of what God is supposed to do will keep you from being diligent and consistent. Because you'll stop. Because you think God's supposed to do that. No. You need to find out your part. Listen, the electrical current is already flowing. But it's up to us to turn the switch on. Yes, you have a right to healing. It's the children's bread. You're supposed to eat it daily. But you must turn the switch on. Yes, you have a right to financial abundance. But you got to turn the switch on. Yes, you have a right to a tranquil lifestyle that's free from anxiety. But you got to turn the switch on. God's not going to get it in and do your part. You want to be free from stuff. But you don't want to change. You don't want to advance. You don't want to move forward. You want to stay in the same spot you're in when God said you can't stay here. Move. Ooh. He says, you got to turn the switch on. So in order to get the benefit of what's already flowing, say it's already flowing. See, you don't have to turn God on. You got to turn you on. 
because he's already flowing. And his goodness and his mercy, his abundance is already flowing towards you. You got to get up and turn the switch on. So to benefit from what's already been flowing to you, you have to participate. Get involved by turning on the switch. That means you got to get up out of your chair. Move from the position you're in to go to the wall and turn the switch on. Well, guess what? The wall not coming to you. If the light gonna ever come on, you had to get up out of the chair and go to the wall and turn it on. Woo. This is why we can't entertain the words of the devil. It'll get you in trouble. It'll stop you from advancing and make you feel like God going to do something that he didn't tell you he was going to do. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Are you learning this morning? I know I'm going slow because I'm, I'm slow on purpose because I want you to hear by the spirit of God because he's correcting some things in us even as I speak. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yeah, yeah, God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And, and he asked him, to, have God said, did God say that to you? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, see, this is why you can't entertain a conversation in your mind or in your daily walking and talking with people. You can't let that stuff enter in because it was through conversation. It was through conversation. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. Or you're going to get smarter. No, he's leading you to the road to being dumb. And you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Listen to me. Look at me. The devil has a history. I just read it to you. The devil has a history of talking people out of God's best. And you ain't no different than Adam and Eve. If you keep listening to the conversation, he'll talk you right out of God's best. Because it means change. And most people don't want to change. But in order to get better, you got to change. But the devil got a history of man on mankind, not just Adam and Eve, but all mankind. He got a history of talking people out of God's best and causing you to settle for mediocrity. He doesn't care if you, if you can just meet your bills, as long as you don't do nothing for the Lord. He don't care if you drive a nice car. That doesn't impress the devil. As long as you don't walk by faith. Woo. So you are settled for lesser than what God planned for you. See, it's a trick. It's a trick. The words of the devil are lies being sown. Look at Genesis chapter 11. Now we're going to see how it was always the plan of God for something to happen to a family. Because what God needed to be done not, not what they needed to be done, what God needed to be done. We got to get our minds off ourselves and start understanding what God needs to be done. Because this ain't about just you. You're too self-absorbed. I talked to a person and, I mean, they talked for a straight hour about themselves. And every now and then I said, mm-hmm. 
Because that's all I'm going to get in that conversation. Mm-hmm. How many of you know they didn't call me to talk to me? They, no, they didn't want to hear what I had to say. They wanted me to hear what they had to say. So this was not a conversation. This was a monologue. It was just one-sided. <laughs> See, the devil make it look like he, he trying to help you. He's a liar. Look at Genesis 11, 11, verse 27. Now these, I'm reading from the Amplified. Now these are the records of the descendants of Terah. Who's Terah? Terah was the father of Abram, or Abraham. He became Abraham later on. He was also the father of Nahor and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died before his father Terah died in the land of his birth, in the land of Ur, of the Chaldeans. So they were still in their land where they grew up in, called Ur of the Chaldeans, when Haran, Lot's father, died. Abram and Nahor took wives. Now, they decided to get married. Now, the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, later called Sarah. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran. So Nahor married his brother's daughter, the father of Milcah and Iscah. That was, so, so Haran had Lot. Milcah and Iscah. But Sarah was barren. She didn't have any children and didn't look like she was going to have any. So Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans into the land. Where were they going? To Canaan. Where were they going? To Canaan. Let's see if they reached there. But when they came to Haran, which was about 550 miles northeast or northwest, rather, of earth, they settled. They accepted mediocrity. It was better than where they were coming from, but it wasn't God's best. They settled in Haran. And guess what Terah did? He died in Haran living amongst his kin people. Now turn right over to the next chapter and look at chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now God is tapping Abraham, Abram, saying, now, can I get one person? I, I gave this plan to the father, but the father dropped the ball because he couldn't disconnect from the relatives. The influence was too big. See, when you're coming out the hood and you move to the next level of living, you got to be careful of family. Everybody not ready for you to leave the hood. And even though they're not in the hood themselves, they got hood in them. And it's like the crab pot. We're not going to let you outdo us. You got to be less than us as long as you're living in Haran. Because we were here first. Oh, man, I could teach a lesson on that one. Mm. But look what the Lord said. The Lord has said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country. Must be a reason. And from thy kindred. And from thy father's house. See, he knew the mindset. Abram was not going to do any better than his father if he continued in the same mindset as his relatives. This is why mind renewal is critical. It's crucial. You can't try to get along with relatives that don't think like you. It doesn't mean you hate them. You don't have to be mean to them. You got to make that line and distinguish who you're going to believe, who you're going to listen to. Because all advice is not good advice. And because it came from your mama, don't make it right. If it goes against this word. When we were raising our children, and even to this day, I don't let people speak into my life that don't show me their commitment to the word. You can't talk in my life. I don't care how long you've been in the church. You, you can't tell me 
about living holy, and I check your resume, and ain't no holiness on your resume. How you going to teach me about being holy? See, you got to stop taking advice from people just because you think they know something. James said, if you lack wisdom, who do you go and ask? Okay. Y'all said that mighty weak. So that tells me who you go first, where you go first, because you should go to God first. You, you see, if we do this stuff right, we can, we'd be down the road, and, man, you'd be so happy. And, yes, it might look like you're lonely. But watch, let me keep reading my, this because I, I, I don't want to park there too long. And the Lord said unto Abram, get out from that country. Leave this place where you have your family parked and from that kindred and from that father's house unto a land that I will show you. Who's going to show him? And I'm going to make thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, not your kin folks. Because if your kin folks help you too long, they're going to take the credit for you being where you are. And they're not going to expect you to give God the glory when they're looking at them. Hmm. If I hadn't helped you with that light bill, your lights would have been turned off. You need to get them out of your hip and trust God for your stuff. You're too dependent on them. That's why the people don't grow up. Because they got these, <laughs> they got relatives that they can run to. And look like they depending on God, because don't nobody know you run into the relative until a situation comes that they can't help you in. Oh, then everybody know where your trust was. He says, see, when, when we was coming up in the faith, and I'm still growing in this, I, we just didn't do certain things. We sanctified ourselves away from certain things to certain people, not because you hate them, but because your life is at line, your life is at stake. Everything about your believer has to do with your sanctification. How well you sanctify yourself from the world. And the Lord told Abram, I want to sanctify you from your kin folks. Because they are toxin. They'll be like a poison if you stay amongst them. They are still your dreams. You can't share no dreams with them because they'll, they'll make fun of it. And they'll, they'll diminish the faith you have. You can't let them know you're doing certain things. <laughs> you can't let them know you believe in God for certain things. Hmm. God says, I'll make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Oh, hallelujah. Now, when he become the blessing, he can reach back and help some of them kin folks. But now he'll have more sense. You understand? When you're in your development stage, you can't expose yourself to in and everything. You're trying to get roots. And not the one from Africa. We're trying to get roots in the kingdom. <laughs> and he says but not only will you be a blessing others gonna bless you he says and I will bless them that bless you and I will curse them that curse you so you ain't gotta worry about the folks that talking about you do you think if I chased everybody to say something against me man I would not be in this pulpit I'd be too distracted God says I know how to handle all your enemies and in thee Abram Shall all families of the earth be blessed? Woo, God had a, God had a, a point that he was going to make. He had an end of the journey. He said, Abraham, stick with me. Just stick with me. Now, so Abraham's father, Terah, settled in Haran with his relatives. God had called the daddy first to go to Canaan. But Terah would not disconnect himself from the relatives. He kept trying to please them instead of continuing to where God said to go. Although Abram, later called Abraham, left the relatives, and he left those relatives who had no plans to do anything for God. Nice people, good churchgoers, 
but they had no plan to do nothing extraordinary with God. If you got a vision, you can't hang around with people with no vision. Because they're not going anywhere. They don't talk the same language that you need to hear. They've already settled. They're not trying to move. See, showing up for service for them is a pinnacle of their expectation. I went to church today, and oh, and the service was high, and the Lord moved, and Lord, I cut up the carpet. I tore that carpet up. And you get back home, same old, same old. I like being around people that tell me they got something going, they're doing something, you know, so I can add my effectual measure of faith to that. Now, Abraham moved away, but guess who he brought with him? A relative. God didn't tell him to bring Lot with him. And if you keep reading, you see Lot caused Abraham more trouble than you can shake a stick at. <laughs> Lot became a problem because he didn't think, nor did he believe, and he didn't talk like Abraham. They had nothing in common but just being in the same family. Woo. We were born to the same, out of the same genes, and that was all they had in common. You got to hear this. Because sometimes we put emphasis on family, and I do too. I stress that because God is a family God. But you got to know what family is because you are following the pattern of somebody that ain't going nowhere all because they family. <laughs>